Welcome to episode 246 of the podcast. Today, my special guest is Simon Binks. Simon is an original founding member of the iconic Australian rock group, Australian Crawl. This conversation took place during the making of my documentary, How Music Connects Us. I had so much content left over, I felt it'd be a travesty not to share this. So if you're listening to this on the podcast platform, I say thank you. If you want to actually watch the interview as well, you could go to my YouTube channel, Johnny Says. The link is in the bio. So um, let's talk about 1983. Okay. Just If I say 1983 and in relation to the music you were making at the time, what comes to mind? You know, it's kind of hard for me to fit everything I, that I did in the 80s into the 80s. But I did do it because I was there. Uh, in 83, I think, that was when we went to tour England with Duran Duran, uh, Britain with Duran Duran. Um, and that was also when we recorded uh, Semantics, which was an, an EP, Four Songs for Australia, but um, a whole LP for the rest of the world. Um, How about if I read you some lyrics? Something that comes to mind. I see the others reading standing as the manly fairy cuts its way to circular key. James was a great lyricist. And talk to us about that. Well, you know, James and I we went to school together, so with Brad. And um, we were living in the one street at one, sta at one stage. And, and we used to go to each other's place and play music, you know, records. Uh, I didn't start guitar un until the end of 73, which was fifth form or year 11, they call it now. Um, so, you know, I, I, in effect, by the time I got everything worked out, it was matriculation, year, you know, year, year 12, uh, 74, before I really started to play. And that's here in Melbourne. Yes, I Mount Eliza just wants some of that. And what, how do the lyrics about the Manly Fairy find their way into an iconic band like your band, Australian Crawl, and that song Reckless? What was the connection with you guys in Sydney? And was that a lyric that had significance or did it just pop up in there? Uh, that's a question better for James, but. Uh, um... He had a girlfriend that was from Sydney and um, uh, she is referred in the song and uh, we must have been at Manly Ferry at some stage. I, I, I can't remember, but well, um, um, you know, they were James's lyrics. He wrote them. Um, and uh, then we started putting it together in the, mu in, in the studio or in the rehearsals. And actually, I think we put it together in the studio. Uh, what was that process like? Was it that he would write the lyrics and then you guys would put the instruments behind it? Or w would you lay out an instrumentation and then he would hear that and then find the lyrics for the sound? Usually James would write the, the, the fundamental chords, you know, like you know, a three-chord pattern or a four-chord pattern. Um, I would do the introductions, the um, segues, the solos, um, uh, and uh, often the solos just went over the same chord progression. And I believe that to be the case in Reckless, but I haven't played it for 30 plus years. It's been that long? Yeah. What was the process? Was it a kind of a free... Um, range of thought if you or one of your bandmates thought that something would sound good in a certain spot or was it the, d did you have the freedom to be like hey man let's maybe add this here or what about if we put this guitar there what was that like well you know i got the nylon string in but james absolutely hated it <laughs> um then the producer mixed it and we didn't like the mix so it was a b-side no it was an no a-side um, so we, we took it to, uh, actually I'm not sure if it was released as, as a single, it was released as an EP 
It must have been released as a single. So we went to uh, the power station in New York and uh, I mixed it there with Neil Dorsman. So, um, um, James was wanting a, an electric guitar part in there, but I thought, no, we've got electric guitar and everything. Um, but he convinced me that at the end there should be an electric guitar. And I'd taken my guitar to, my, I had another 65, um, um, I'd taken my guitar to New York, but no amp. But the, the engineer was Neil Dorsman, who is a friend of Mark Knopfler's, and Mark just lived around the corner. So we borrowed Mark's Music Man um, amplifier, and I had one of those, and I didn't really like them. I moved on to Marshall's. So I tried to get a sound out of that for the solo, the end solo, the, you know, the fade out of, of Reckless, but I, I really wish I'd had my Marshall amplifier. And, and I... I never got into distortion pedals uh, because the guys that were guiding me were, the, you know, these guys from England who worked with Led Zeppelin and all these people, and they're saying, you know, you get tubes, you know, get your amp to distort. And I was new to this, so that's what I was trying to do. Um, I wish to hell I'd found an Ibanez tube screamer. You know, if I'd found that, uh, my guitar playing would have been so much, or my solos would have been so much better. So you know that that solo at the end of Reckless is kind of wimpy. You know, it's it's it doesn't scream, which is what a tube scream will make it do. Uh, I've got one now. I've got a whole range of pedals now. But but um, yeah, I mean, I, I I got my classical solo in. James talked me into the end solo, and he was right. You so know, he, did he want that classical that that solo you're referencing? The one you got in is a Spanish sounding guitar. Correct? Yeah, it's a classical guitar. Yeah. Was that agreed upon by everyone? Because that sound in that song is very different from the rest of the heartbeat of that song. I feel it makes the song. It the, adding that contrast. That's what of I thought. That, was but, everyone agreed that that was going to be a case, or did you have to fight to add that in? I had to fight. James hated it. He wanted to re re replace it with a screaming electric guitar. And I. Um... And what was the sentiment of the fans? Everyone seemed to like it, except. Reproducing it on stage was a problem. Um, I tried getting a, the, you know, the the same guitar, and and because miking up acoustics was in its infancy back then, um, I ended up just playing using a Strat and turning the volume down to five and getting a clean sound for for the um, for that part. If, if so. Somebody... If people would dig out a library of Australian influential rock bands, you guys would be in a, in a cluster of bands such as, uh, they were later, you were before them, but like NXS is in that statement. You have Little River Band. You have, um, what was the other one we were talking about? Cold Chisel. Cold, uh, Cold Chisel, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cold Chisel were a great band. Mm -hmm. um, Ian Moss is a fantastic guitarist and vocalist, a great singer. Do we... I always think about this. Are people aware? Is the average music fan aware of these of these significant noises that were coming out of Australia that that hit international waters? I get emails and messages all the time. I got one from New York from a producer. He sent me the um, introduction to Oh Not You Again and asked me if it was right. Um, and that's kind of cool. Yeah, Midnight that's... Oil was another one. Midnight Oil, a great band, yeah. And these are all born on Austra in Australian soil. Yeah, and then you've got Split Ends, but they came from New Zealand. Okay. They're a great band, and out of Split Ends, Crowded House. Mm -hmm. um, the Finn Brothers, very talented. Yeah, we talked about off air before we press record about one of your first performances on national TV. It was the Countdown show on ABC. Uh, if I've done my research correctly, it was a show that predicts what's going to be hot regarding music and bands. And your singer, uh, James Rain, had casts on both wrists or hands. What was that yeah. about? We were rehearsing in uh, rehearsal rooms above a music store in Chapel Street in, in um, the, the South Yarra. Uh, and uh, it was, you know, Chapel Street's a main street. And uh, James was crossing the street, and the car 
you know, came at him and he put his hands out um, as, a, as a reaction and uh, that broke two really small bones in his wrist, each wrist. So he had to have them in plaster. And then we got a, you know, a, a, a chance to perform on Countdown and that's not something a new band would ever turn down. So he had to do it with his hands in plaster and I didn't care. I don't think James did and I don't think anyone did. If the average person would Google Australian Crawl and it's, I guess some bands, every single song by the band is by one person. Is written, like for instance, Billy Corgan from the Smashing Pumpkins. Before they even release an album, he is the man who played the drums, the guitars, the the pianos. He's written the music, and then he takes the he takes the the band mates with him on tour. He had that complete control of everything in the songwriting process. With you guys, you didn't see that. There, were, there everybody seemed to pitch in some on vocals, some on instrumentation, some in the songwriting side of things. With you personally, the guitar was your your bread and butter. Would you? Have, do you find the songwriting process lyrically and singing equally as fulfilling as the instrumentation? Well, I I, um, I helped with writing all the songs, but with my own songwriting, um, that didn't really come until after Australian Crawl. I've got dozens of songs in there now that we don't have in the music industry. But during Australian Crawl, I was very clumsy. My lyrics were... Because James is such a good lyricist. You were in your early 20s? Yeah. I think we started when I was 23. And you and James knew each other since boys? Yeah, I can't remember. James came from South Africa maybe what was called Form 1 back then. I'm not sure. Mm. Brad came from Adelaide uh, earlier, earlier than that, I think. Um, and you're not in contact with these guys anymore? Well, I, I stupidly I agreed to Pete. I'm like, uh, I've been, I've, I was battling for years how we should be controlling the uh, music downloads. You know, how we should have a code in, in, embedded in the music so it would only play uh, on something that has a decoder, um, which would be easy to do. Uh, and then a car affair called me and wanted to do some, I thought that was what they wanted to talk about. And I was more than happy to talk about that because the music, the arts in general, are a social conscience. We really need them. And in the, in the Vietnam War, it was really largely the music of the late 60s, early 70s, that raised popular consciousness against the futility of that war. I mean, there was no reason for us to be in Vietnam. Um, all, all, um, how do you mean? No. Um, all Vietnam wanted was independence, which I don't quite understand because the, the, the Japanese got the independence for every other Asian nation in World War Two. I don't know why Vietnam didn't. The French were in Vietnam. Um, so music plays a vital role of these turbulent times that helps change the way people think. Absolutely. During whatever turbulent times. You saw, like you said, Dylan. I, on the way here, I was introducing him to Nina Simone, who was on the, the civil rights movement side in, in, in the United States, You know, literally taking on the stance of the voice of the oppressed. And you're, like you said, now in probably equally as turbulent times for various other reasons different to the 60s without that voice that music once played and served as what do you think some of the negative consequences maybe are or can be well we shouldn't be in the middle east you know those wars are completely unnecessary we should never have gone into iraq um cause more trouble than it cured um, and you know, the, the hate the term collateral damage, you know, which is you know, civilians killed, but so many you know, we shouldn't be in Afghanistan, we shouldn't be in an Iraq. I'm sure we're going to go into Syria. Um, when I say we, you know, it's America, really. I mean, we just follow along like a loyal, stupid puppy dog, uh, but we shouldn't. 
um, you know, we we you know, have the United Nations, which is something of a toothless tiger, but it shouldn't be. I mean, we should we should the United Nations should have the power that wars are not necessary, but differences should be negotiated. Um, but this is where the arts were really important because, you know, the music did stop the Vietnam War. And I, I, I think, you know, those that profit by war, I think it's, it's slipped by them. And I wonder if now um, the kind of death of the music industry is because they're not going to let it slip by them again. Do you think there's a connection? Possibly. Between the industrial military complex. Mil it's, yeah. that, it's that famous speech Eisenhower gave. You can Absolute, find it on YouTube. Yep. I've got it on my, he, my, yeah, on as my Facebook. As he was leaving office, yep. he was warning the American people and the free world about the power and control that his government had and has on the outcomes of as what the future as will did, look like. As did Kennedy just before he was killed. Mm. And so the arts, the arts definitely play a significant role in challenging that that thought process. And so it did. It doesn't really anymore. I mean, I mean, you think that was planned though? I don't know, but it's certainly a possibility. Interesting. Uh, Pink came out and sang that song, "Dear Mr. President." Um, but she, yeah, and there are a few other bands. Pardon I've, me for my ignorance on not knowing this, but were there more record companies? In back in the eighties than there are now, or has it been monopolized into just a few? Kind of like the the meat industry in America. They say in like the seventies there were thousands of these farms that you could you know uh, factory farming, and now in America I think, I think there's four. It's all good. Sorry, it's all good. Rock and roll. So what was it like being in your early twenties? revolutionizing rock, Australian rock and roll, being on the world stage, but more within Sydney, Australia, within Melbourne. What was the vibe like? What was the feeling like? What do you remember most and what do you miss the most about those times in the early 80s? Well, it was an amazing time and it was a hell of a lot of fun because I was with two of my closest friends, Brad and James. You know, Brad was the best friend of my lifetime. Um, James and I were really close, uh, so to, to set out and tour the country and then go other places um, with guys you'd grown up with, uh, it was basically Peninsula School, the class of 74, on the road. You know, it was um, the same sense of humour, the same in-jokes. We had our own language that no one else understood, uh, but it was a really great time. It was a really creative time. There are plenty of outlets like Countdown. Um, as I said before, you could gig two or three times a day if you wanted to, and sometimes we did. Uh, sometimes, it, you know, we complained about gigging too much, but uh, I wouldn't complain about that now. Do you think you guys were aware at the time of what was going on? Um, yes, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we were just young guys doing what we loved, you know, and, uh, um, you know, we wouldn't let it carry us away, uh, thinking that we were more than we were, you know, we were just in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. Um, and, uh, we had this kind of understanding between the three of us that no one's going to get big headed because the other two will pounce on them. Um, so, uh, we, we had a great time. It was, I, I, I'm still writing and playing music now. You know, I, it's what I do. It's what I've always done. I, I was, I was a, you know, a classical violinist when I was I'm not 10, 8, um, and um, then when I got in my teens, it became uncool to carry a violin case to school, so I got into 
dirt bikes, started racing dirt bikes and started racing motocross when I turned 16. When I turned 17, I got my first guitar uh, and motocross and playing guitar are somewhat mutually exclusive because you get a lot of injuries playing uh, racing motocross. So I still get riding, but just enduro um, uh, because my career was going to be music and the guitar was my instrument. Do you, was there one, is there a story that you could share from it, it, right when you guys were in that, that phase of putting in the work, putting in the effort, grinding it out, doing those gigs? Sometimes you said you might have done too many to where it flipped and you started realizing like, oh shit, we've made it. I, I don't know if it flipped. I think it just gradually... Was there a certain gig? What were the crowds like? Were they packed? Were there... Yeah. Like, yeah. how big are we talking? Um, who was opening for you? Were people... Were you opening for people? Maybe something like that. Um, I'm sure we did open for people at the beginning. Um, I can't remember who. Um, but we started being the main act really quickly. Uh, we, we we started off, James and I started off in, a, well, we started off in about 76, just rehearsing in halls, and, and I'd play guitar, and James would play the drums, and uh, then he wanted to sing, so I positioned the microphone for him to start singing, and then, and then um, he, he got asked to be in a band called Spiff Rouch, which was the McDonough Brothers band. And so he asked me to get into that band. And um, then we decided we wanted to start our own band. So we left and uh, I went to Bali for my first international trip. And when I got back, we started putting Australian Crawl together. That was 78, maybe maybe the end of 77. Um, and in 79, one of our friends drove up to Noosa from Melbourne, the, the Beach Road, the Coast Road, booking gigs all the way for this band that no one had ever heard of. And uh, it was, you know, we were all friends. So, you know, we loaded up the combi van and my station wagon and, and we drove up there and it was, it was great. But, you know, we played to Coffs Harbour to, I think it was eight people, but we knew four of them. <laughs> Um, How were you getting paid? Was it cash in hand the whole time? In those days, it, it was just money from the gigs, so it wasn't very much. And we were putting it all back into the band, back into equipment. You know, I, I had you know, the best guitars I could buy. What was your favorite? When you guys made it at, 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 at Australian Scroll Pinnacle in Australia, what was your favorite venue to play at? Uh, there was one in Sydney. Um, Yeah, I can't think of the name of it now. There's one. What made it special? It was big, and it was down by the beach, so there were always bronzed girls there, uh, and that was a big part of it. Was it Manly? Manly was good. The Manly Vale Hotel was good, uh, but this gig was not Manly. But uh, I can't think what it was. Can you remember playing in Manly? Like yeah. playing gigs in Manly? Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Some of the gigs they used to play. It was pretty much the same. You know, lots of girls in the front rows, you no know, bronze. You know. What was the social scene like there? Um. You know, look, it, the yeah, whole thing was a constant party. There we go. You know, <laughs> it, it was. It was just you know, uh, um, playing and then. Going out after the gig, uh, there were, in Sydney there was the Manza Room, there was um, um, Benny's, I think. There were a number of places to go. Um, uh, and then, then there was the Siebel Bar, which was f famous. There. Um, we used to stay at the Siebel when we went to Sydney, and uh, the Siebel Bar was not that big, but it was just everyone knew each other there. And, and uh, John the barman, you know, it was just a, it was a really friendly, fun environment. You know, I mean, how could you complain about doing what you do, doing what you love, getting paid for it, and partying at the same time? 
Uh, how can that be bad? Do you mind if we if we ask you to pull out an old one of your guitars and maybe strum along? I was going to ask, oh, a question. Tell yeah. me one. So, yeah. like being born and raised in Australia, your music was always in the background of other house events, our family barbecues, um, and I suppose it's evolved over time. Where still to this day, I was explaining to Johnny that we can go to the pub and all the mates will grab a schooner and sing the boys light up when it comes over the speaker and like it's a big part of our culture and has impacted us. I just want to know how does it feel to have that influence over the Australian culture just through your music? How does it how does well, it, 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 it it's, it's, on that? It's a, it's it's a good feeling. But at the same time, you know, that was thirty years ago. Um, I, I, I get your point, they're still playing it now. But all my playing is in that room. You know, I, I never get to play live anymore, uh, which is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, James is playing, but he's got someone else playing my parts. Um, and um, But I would not really want to go out there and play our old songs. If I mean, James, Australian Crawl will never get together again because without Brad... Um, but if that were not the case, uh, I would not want to be working on new, new songs mm. because I, I know James has grown as a musician and a songwriter and I've become what I was not then. I mean, I, I didn't really get the opportunity in Australian Crawl because James's lyrics were so good that it was kind of intimidating. Um, uh, but people have heard my tracks and they love my lyrics now. So, you know, I, I read, I can't tell if because all the books are packed away, but I read a lot. Right. Um, and um, I'm a big fan of the English language. Um, um, so that's reflected in the lyrics now. Yeah. And back then, not so much. Mm -hmm.